Questions from the homework number six, 8.5 hours. I want to change that to seconds. How do I go from hours to seconds? Well, it's 8.5 times 60 minutes in one hour times 60 seconds in one minute. That's my period. I'm going to write that down up here. T equals 37, sorry, uppercase T. Can you guys stop talking, whoever that is? Thank you. Appreciate that. T equals, what did I say it was? 30,600. Okay. What do you want me to find, Brandon? So I'm going to start out by going gravity equals circular. Okay. Gravity is always going to be big G, big M, little m over R squared. And then don't write this next bit down. Circular is always going to be MAC, but I need to figure out which AC I want to use. So I'm going to erase that. There are two. One ha Which one do I want to use? Sorry? Th th this is the key to doing this question, which is why I'm asking. So you probably want your formula sheet out. I suggested you guys all have it out because we're going to be using a game today. Mass of the Earth, mass of the moon. And, you know, who wants to memorize all that? So there are two equations. Taylor, how do you know I want to use that one and not the v squared over r? Period. Right? So I'm going to be using the, erase that, erase that. I'm going to be using the 4 pi squared r over t squared. But just don't forget, you got to put the mass in front. Although conveniently, Brandon, uh, mass cancels. Con come on, Pam. Conveniently, mass cancels. What do they want me to find? I move both of these to the top. I'll have three of them there. That will move there. Those will move down. I'll get this. R cubed equals big, come on, pen. big G, big M, T squared, all over four, Pi squared. Sorry? Yeah, it feels like I'm running out of ink. Is that okay? How do you get rid of a cubed? So here's the answer. It's going to be that. Now we've got to type it into our calculator correctly. Where G, big G is 6.67 times 10 to negative 11. M is, are we on the Earth? Yes. The mass of the planet. So by the way, could I have you orbiting the moon? Yes. Could I give you the mass of, let's say, Mars and orbit that just to be different? Yes. Uh, period is 30,000. So let's see. I'm running out of room to write, Brandon, so I'm just going to go straight to my calculator. Sorry? You're fine from here? Okay. Number nine? Brandon, you got that written down because i got to erase this because I need to do number nine right here too. Okay. Good, 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 good. Okay. Okay. I am running out of ink, it seems. There we go. Who asked number nine? Okay. Astronaut Sally stands on a bathroom scale when in orbit. Are they floating in orbit? What did we say at the beginning of class? What? Are, sorry? Okay, free fall. What does a scale read? Doesn't read weight. Doesn't read mass. Jacob, what does a scale read? Normal force. It can't possibly read your weight or your mass because I did a demo at the beginning of the year showing that even though your weight and mass weren't changing, the scale was changing. So here's the real question. What's the normal force when you're in orbit? Okay. Uh, you can prove it by going winner minus loser. We would have, oh, mg down, normal force up, and you would say, well, this is going to be mg minus normal force because he's in free fall equals m, except the acceleration in free fall is also g, and you're going to find in that equation there for that to be true, normal force does have to be zero. Or you could have gone like this and noticed uh, that normal force is zero in orbit. But you, what you really had to remember, and it was a good review, is what does the scale measure? It doesn't measure mass. 
So we're in outer space, let's suppose. And let's suppose we have uh, Alyssa and Jacob in the space shuttle. And Alyssa, you have a 1,000 kilogram satellite, big satellite, and you and Jacob are both in the cargo hold. It's shut, so there's air. But you gently push the satellite across the cargo hold. You give it a shove, and you let it go. And it majestically glides across the cargo hold because it's in free fall. And Jacob decides that rather than stop this 1,000 kilogram satellite with his hands, he's going to stop it with his face because he thinks to himself, well, it has no weight, so it won't hurt. Is that correct? It's still going to break his nose because the mass hasn't vanished. And Newton's first law talked about inertia. It still has inertia. It still is going to require a force to bring it to a stop. So it would be easy to keep it moving, and you could apply a very small force to get it moving as opposed to here on Earth where with friction you'd have to really, yeah, really push the thing, a 1,000 kilograms, that's a fair chunk. But to bring it to a stop, you'd have to give yourself plenty of time to be able to slowly, 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 slowly apply a force to it to bring it to a stop. Right? Ten? Is that what somebody asked? Okay. I sort of like this question. Not this specific question, but this key concept of gravitational field. That's going to be on your test. Because this is not talking, this is not talking about gravitational force. This is talking about gravitational field. And what you need to realize is gravitational field, symbol lowercase g, is calculated by going big G, big M over R squared. Where'd that come from? We did it in the lesson. It comes from the idea that if big G, big M, little m over R squared also equals mg. And if we cancel out both masses, we're ending up with gravitational field is big G, big M over R squared. That's how we calculate it. We know the answer on Earth. What's the gravitational field strength on Earth? 9.8. What it's saying is if it's 8.75, how high are you? Oh, sorry. Uh, how fast are you moving? Well, I can use this to figure out how high I am. R is going to be the square root of big G, big M over G. And once I know what my radius is, then I can go FG equals FC. I can go big G, big M, little m over R squared equals MV squared over R using V squared because they want to find the orbital speed. Hey, one of my R's cancels. Mass cancels. Yay. And I can tell you uh, once I square root how fast the space station must be moving. I'm, I don't really have enough room. I guess I can do it right here. Do you want me to do it? I can do it if you want. Sure. Okay, let's... Are you okay with this little line of reasoning here? And the key idea is, and the part I do like, is giving you the gravitational field somewhere in space and asking you to do something with it. Because the most common mistake, Aaron, is kids right away put... I uh, think this is the force. It's not newtons. It's newtons per kilogram. So let's see. What orbital radius does the space station orbit at if it has a gravitational field strength of 8.75? Now, that doesn't mean that they feel that because they're in free fall. But it does mean that if you wanted to measure it, that's what it's going to, or calculate it. Let's see. Uh, no, I want R, Mr. Duick. Their orbital radius is going to be the square root of 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11, 5.98 times 10 to the 24th, all over, compare it with the Earth's of 9.8, no, not 9.8, Mr. Duick, that's just going to give me the radius of the Earth, come on, I want to use 8.75, crunch the numbers, Really what the problem is, is I have way too many programs open at once here. There, let's try that.
Get one computer. Six point six seven scientific notation button negative eleven times five point nine eight scientific notation button twenty four divided by eight point seven five square root. So that's the orbital radius. That's not its altitude. That's its distance from the center of the Earth. If I wanted its altitude, I would subtract whatever the radius of the Earth is. 6.75 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Now I'd like to find its speed. So I would say gravity equals circular. Gravity equals circular with the V in it. And I think I'll end up with V being the square root of big G, big M, over R. Which is going to be... Oh, you know what? I noticed right here, two lines ago, I have big G times big M divided by something. I'm going to go like this. And instead of 8.75, what do I want to divide by in this question here? There, that's going to save me some time. And square root that. Speed should be 7686. Is that what it says, I hope? There you go. By the way, International Space Station, not very high. Most of our orbital stuff, not very high. Any more? Yep. Yuck, 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 yuck. You got you notice the 80 blah, right? So first thing I would do is go 80 divided by 3.6, uh, 22.22 meters per second. 22.22 meters per second. Ready? Aaron, what path is this car tracing out? Where is my net force then towards the... What force is pushing it in the center? Gravity straight down. Uh, that's why we can't turn on ice. So the key idea here is to recognize friction equals Fc. And I'm going to use mv squared over r because they told me it's speed. Friction is what times what? Mu times the normal force. I don't know the normal force. It's going to be mu times gravity because this looks like a flat curve. So far, so good? Conveniently, yay! That cancels. And they want me to find the radius. So I would have gone, okay, r equals v squared over mu g. Do I know v? 22.22. Do I know g? Yep. Oh, what don't I know? What information haven't I used anything of yet? That whole beginning of the track, like, why the heck did they give me that? I haven't used it yet. Oh, um, hey, when the car is accelerating, what force is pushing it forwards? Friction. Do you think maybe I might be able to solve for what coefficient of friction that I need based on the information that they gave me here? Ooh, cool. Let's see. Let's see. So uh, the car is accelerating forwards. It's really friction that's pushing the car forwards. Friction is what times what? I don't know the normal force. Oh, but you know what? We're on a flat ground. I'm pretty sure the normal force is mg. I think we really have this. Mu mg is equal to ma. And conveniently, Aaron, uh, the masses cancel and I get this mu equals the acceleration divided by G now I know G that's good um, 
Oh, what acceleration? Look what they told me. Look what they've told me. They've told me that VI is zero. See it? And V final is 120. No, not 120. 22.22222222. And they told me the distance is 120. Could I figure out what A has to be? So this is a nice question. I, I'm not going to say I like this question, I like this question, in, in that I think to me this would be a little bit tricky for the test, but look at this. Unit 1, Unit 2, Unit 5. Ooh, that's, a, that's not bad at all. You see where we're going now, by the way? So, and you can find the acceleration. Once you get mu, plug mu into there, and it's going to be b squared. Oh, yeah, you'll use bs squared equals bi squared plus 2ad. Yep. Okay. And you should get 240. Someone was saying to me, by the way, on some of these questions on the geosynchronous one, um, if you use a different period of the Earth or something like that, you get slightly different answers. Uh, who was asking me about that? Someone. Okay. Um, I'd probably take both on a test then. So the Earth is... 24 hours times 60 minutes times 60 seconds, 86,400. What does it say on the sheet? 861. No, Earth is 24. We, we, we determined that time. The days of the year we're stuck with not being equal, but the Earth, I'm pretty sure, is exactly 24 hours, I thought. Yeah, like we, we divided the length of one day into 24 chunks. One Earth's rotation. Hmm. We'll come back to that. I, I, I'm going to do some emailing and Googling and find out if that's a typo or not, or what the deal is with that. Is that it, it says the Earth's period of rotation. Is that what it says on the sheet? No. 8.61. Okay. I will take both for now, but let's move on. This seems to be where kids start to get stuff mixed up a little bit. So turn your brains on. Lesson six. Orbital potential energy. So last day, lesson five, we looked at orbits, uh, being up in space. Today, we're going to be looking at orbital potential energy getting up into space. So last day was once you're there, how does it work? How high do you have to be? How fast do you have to be traveling? How long does it have to take you to go around? What we're going to be looking at today is getting yourself up there. And this is where you're going to start to see some really big numbers. This is where you're going to start to see why it's so expensive to get stuff there. Keeping stuff in outer space, cheap. Basically, it stays up there as long as you want to. Now, probably some of the lower satellites 
aren't completely out of the Earth's atmosphere, because the Earth's atmosphere doesn't just stop. It goes for quite a while, but it's so thin there. They're almost near zero, but there's probably a tiny bit of friction, Taylor. They probably have to occasionally accelerate to keep themselves going. But getting up there, big bucks. Okay. By the way, what was the equation for potential energy? Do you guys remember? Now, this is what we've been doing so far. Don't write this down. The problem is G is only 9.8 where? On the Earth's surface. We're going to have to derive a cosmic potential energy equation. So let's do it. Recall the area under a force versus distance graph. So if we have a force versus distance graph, and we'll draw a nice line kind of like that, What was this area here? Do you remember? Okay. Now I'm going to be a bit fussier. Erwin said work. I'm going to be a bit fussier. It was, if I call this location A and I call this location B, it's the work required to move from A to be because we want to talk about how much work is required to move from the Earth's surface to an orbit. The, the problem is for a graph of gravitational force Fg versus separation distance R, what would that look like? Well, put your pencils down for a second. Math 12s, don't write all this down. I'm just going to show you a quick argument here. As it turns out, gravity is proportional to 1 over r squared. Math 12s, really that's similar in terms of a graph to the reciprocal of a parabola. And so for those of you that are in Math 12, you've done the reciprocal transformation. Uh, bigger becomes smaller, smaller becomes bigger, zeros become asymptotes, asymptotes become zeros. The reciprocal of a parabola, it looks an awful lot like this. Never quite gets to zero and shoots off to infinity over here. And this is where the system kind of breaks down because you're saying, oh, does that mean there's an infinite gravitational field at the center of the Earth? No, it don't work. It looks like this, though. Okay. That's what the gravitational field force graph looks like. Now, does, that, does this make sense? As you move further away from the planet, what happens to the force of gravity? Gets bigger or gets smaller? Gets smaller. Okay. Does it ever truly reach zero? Well, no. You could argue at the edge of the universe for all intents and purposes it is. Calculus students, yes, it's a limit. But you can see we're getting closer and closer and closer to zero but never quite touching. So let's consider a specific example. Once again, we're going to draw F, G, and R. Here's our little curvy graph. But we're going to add a specific location right about here. And we're going to call this point right here the radius of the Earth. And we're going to add another location. How about uh, right here? And we're going to call this point right here our orbit. How much energy will it require for us to move from the surface of the Earth to just lift an object in orbit. Now, we're only talking about potential energy here. Once you're in orbit, if you want to stay there, can you stand still? No. What do we have to do? We said we have to give you a sideways velocity that matches the curvature of the Earth. So you also need some kinetic energy. All we're looking at right now, Evan, is just lifting it up to you know however many hundred miles. But if you let it go, it will fall because it's not in orbit. We haven't given it a sideways velocity. But how much work would it take? this much.
this area is how much work, read how much energy, to lift from Earth's surface to orbit. But I'm going to put in brackets standing still. So how are you staying up there? Well, you can imagine little visible angels are holding you or something like that. Because as soon as, as soon as, in other words, we're going to freeze time, Megan, right? We've done this a lot. We're going to freeze time. As soon as time actually did start, this thing would come crashing back down. Oh, unless we give it enough sideways kinetic energy, you're going to start to see why, again, it's so expensive to put stuff in orbit. Not only are the potential energy numbers huge, but then, did we calculate orbital speed last day? So think a half mv squared of those things, and they were big numbers. You have to get that much potential, or sorry, kinetic energy as well to keep it up there. That's all got to come from the fuel cells, from the rockets, from the reactor, whatever, however you're powering your object. It's all got to come from somewhere. The energy is conserved. Yep. Oh, they've talked about the space elevator. Um, theoretically, we could build one. That'd be a cheaper way to put stuff in orbit because you could do it using electric currents, and you'd already have something up there. And probably in a couple of days, I might go off on a tangent and talk about it. But for now, in terms of our current level of technology, because we are finding it is useful to have stuff up there, it's rockets. It's rockets. It is rocket science, so to speak. Um, they're not hugely inefficient. Otherwise, we wouldn't have done so many. It's, it's more that they're dangerous, they're risky, stuff goes wrong fairly often. It's much harder than you realize. It would be nice to have a simple, reliable... Again, we built six space shuttles. Two of them exploded. That's not a great... That's a 33% failure rate from NASA, the best in the planet. Not really that good. Got to be a better way. Here's our problem. Zach... We don't have an equation for finding the area under a curve. Calculus was invented to do that, and those who are in calculus, when you start doing something called integration, you'll learn shortcuts for doing it. But right now, we're going to have to cheat. So work equals force times distance. Work equals which force? Big G, big M, little m over r squared. Times the distance that we're moving it from the center of the Earth is r. This is sort of a fake work times distance equation. Technically, I can't do this mathematically because this force is changing. To really derive this equation, I would love to be able to integrate it and show you where it comes from in calculus. I can't. Here is our cosmic potential energy equation. Big G, big M, little m, all over R. Because can you see one of the R's cancels? Unfortunately, what does that look an awful lot like? Force. Don't get them mixed up. What's the difference? Uh, R squared versus R. Oh, wait a minute. One more thing. Look at your formula sheet. Find gravitation. Find potential energy. And you notice we're not quite right. Negative. Negative. Why negative? Negative. Suppose we went to the edge of the universe, and the phrase that we use is relative to zero at infinity. Suppose we went out to infinity. If you were far away from any planet, if we let you go, would you fall anymore? No. So if you won't fall, how much potential energy do you have? Zero. None as a number. Zero. So 
If you're not at the edge of the universe, you must have less potential energy because we'd have to do work to get you to the edge of the universe. What's a number that's less than none? Negative. Okay. As soon as we start talking about potential energy on the cosmic scale, we refer everything relative to zero at infinity. Out at infinity, you have no potential energy, so that must mean you have less than that. Negative. Oh, it's a terrible example. It's a terrible example. Who's my calculus students? Okay. It's negative because if you take the derivative of this with respect to r, you need to get the gravitational equation. And you need a negative to cancel. Take the derivative of that with respect to r, and you'll get f equals big G, big M, little m over r squared. Okay? So, what numbers are less than zero potential energy? Negative numbers. Now, don't worry, you'll get positive answers because often we'll be doing change in. And what's change in anything? Final minus initial. And that minus initial, because it's going to be a minus minus, is often going to give you a positive answer. So don't freak out. Just be really careful with your signs. So we use the phrase relative to zero at infinity. Example one, then. How much work is done in lifting a 1,200 kilogram satellite from the surface of the Earth to a height of 1.2 times 10 to the seventh meters. So what we're talking about here is, come on, come on, uh, circle. Jeez, not cooperating with me right now. Okay, we're going to try this, Mr. Duick. Is that roughly circular? A little bit further this way, Mr. D. Okay, there's the Earth. They've told us the height, h, is 1.2 times 10 to the 7th. But remember, in our equations, we don't use h. We use r for radius. And that's going to be the distance from the center of the Earth. So what am I going to have to do to this number? I'm going to have to add the radius of the Earth, R-E. Let's try that again, Mr. D. The radius of the Earth. So let's make a little note here then. The orbital radius is going to be 1.2 times 10 to the 7th plus, what was the radius of the Earth? 6 point something. 6.38 times 10 to the... What is my orbital radius? I always, if they say height or altitude, I always take care of that first because I'm worried I'll forget later on. One point eight three eight times ten to the seventh, and I'll carry the extra sig figs because I'm going to be using this answer. So my orbital radius is one point eight three eight times ten to the seventh meters. You guys see why we had to add the radius of the Earth to this one? Because instead of saying radius, they said height. All right, Kyle, what's this question want me to find? What's this question want me to find, Kyle? Now that you're back with me, how much work? Now, we have a bunch of definitions for work. We have work is force times distance. We can't use that because the force changes the higher you go, gravity changes. We could use area under a curve, except we can't find the area under a curve. So we're going to have to use our third one, which is work is equal to the change in potential plus the change in kinetic. So here's our satellite on the Earth's surface. What's its kinetic energy right now? Zero. And when I lift it up and just leave it hanging there, what's its kinetic energy at the end? 
zero. So I'm going to cross this out, but I'm always going to remind myself that that's there because as soon as they start saying, oh, and put it in orbit, well, then there's going to be some kinetic energy to boot. What's changing anything? So work is equal to potential energy final minus potential energy initial. And in unit three, we would have gone MGH final minus MGH initial. But now we have to use cosmic potential energy because we're talking about big distances and we're getting away from the planet. Work is going to be equal to what was potential energy on the cosmic scale? Negative. Big G, big M, little m, all over R final minus negative. Big G, big M, little m, all over R initial. This thing. Right there. Oh, but final minus initial, it's the radius that's changing. Do the masses cancel this time? No, because there's no mass in work, which makes sense because a heavier object should be more expensive to lift into orbit. In fact, now it's straight plug and chug, and this is one of the few times I do not try and do this all in one step. I'm going to get this number, I'm going to get this number, and then I'm going to add, oh, wait a minute. What's a minus minus the same as? Okay, the work is going to be negative 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. 5.98 times 10 to the 24th. What was the mass of the satellite? What did I say? 1,000? 1,200? All over. My final radius is 1.838 times 10 to the 7th. Or when I have a minus minus, I'm just going to do a plus. 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. 5.98 times 10 to the 24. 1,200. All divided by. What's my initial radius? Oh, radius of the Earth. Good, I'm starting off on the Earth's surface. Oh, except instead of writing RE, what is it, Erwin? 6.38 6 times 10 to the 6th. Who has the good graphing calculators? Here's the nice thing. Here's how I handle these. The other reason I type this all in at once is can you see only one number is different before and after, which means if I go second function enter, I can have the second thing appear and just change the bottom number. First number, first term, it's going to go like this. Negative. 6.67, scientific notation button, negative 11, times 5.98, scientific notation button, 24, times 1,200, divided by 1.838, scientific notation button, 7. And I get negative 2.604 times 10 to the 10th. Plus. And the nice thing here, Erwin, is if I go second function, enter, I need to delete the negative, which I can do pretty quickly. Bonk. And I change the bottom number to uh, 6.38 times 10, 6.38 times 10 to the 6th. I think that's a way easier way to do this. You make sure you're very careful on your first one. And I get... 7.502 times 10 to the 10th, is that right? That's what that times 10 to the 10th means. Okay. Done? The block for you? Put it face down on block D for me today. And my final answer, Zach, I'm going to do this number, which I already have stored conveniently, minus, because that's a negative, minus 2.604 times 10 to the 10th. 
how much energy. Now you'll notice I get a positive answer, which I should, because it does take work to move it up there. It should require energy. 4.89. In fact, you know what? To two sig figs, 4.90, isn't it? Times 10 to the 10. Units for work? Joules. Is that a fair number of joules? Yeah. It's expensive. Uh, it would depend, but uh, do some Googling. You'll find out. I, there is a site. I used to know it roughly. It was how much per meter it cost. It was how much per meter per kilogram, I think, or something like that. Because, of course, the bigger the mass, the more expensive it is, too. Okay? Now, that's just lifting it up and then having invisible angels holding it there. That's not what happens in real life. We lift it up, and then once we're up there, we give it a tangent velocity. We give it some kinetic energy. Now, technically, you don't lift it up and then head straight sideways. You go up in kind of a curvy, uh, kind of a sort of a per parabolic trajectory, but not quite. But it's kind of a curvy shape. But you know what? Since energy is a scalar, who cares what path you trace out? All we want to know is before and after. This is like those roller coaster questions where we didn't care about what was happening with the hills. We just want to know how high at the beginning, how high at the end. Here, we want to know how high at the end and how fast at the end. Example two. How much work is done placing a 925 kilogram satellite? I forgot the word satellite. Whoops. In orbit. I am going to underline the word in orbit. That means it's not standing still. In other words, we have this. Work equals, I like this question, I like this question, I like this question, I like this question. Work equals change in potential plus change in kinetic. It has kinetic energy too. What's change in anything? What's changed in anything? I'm going to treat these separately. Let's do the change in kinetic first. A half mv in orbit squared minus a half mv initial. Oh, wait a minute. Before we launch, how fast are we traveling? But that velocity is orbital velocity. How do I find that? We did it last lesson. How did we find orbital velocity or orbital speed? Ah, this is where we said gravity equals circular. Right? Big G big M, little m, all over r squared equals m. Which circular am I going to use? v squared over r or 4 pi squared r over t squared? First one, because they're talking about velocity. Brandon, no need to be whistling. But Brandon, you will notice not only does the mass cancel, one of my R's cancels. And you know what? What do I have by itself here? V squared. Now, normally I'd square root, except what do I have kind of right here? V squared. Why don't I just leave it as V squared? Save myself some angst. In fact, I get this. When we're talking about putting something in orbit, the change in kinetic is equal to one-half little m, what's v squared the same as? Big G, big M over R. I don't really memorize that one. As I've said to you, I fall back to here and I can figure out whatever I need to figure out. This is going to be a half 
little satellite. 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. 5.98 times 10 to the 24th. All divided by... Oh, and they didn't give me a height or an altitude. They gave me the radius. So I don't need to worry about adding in the Earth's radius. All divided by 2.6 times 10 to the 7th. How much kinetic energy will my satellite have to have once it's up there? Otherwise, it's falling back down to the Earth. 0.5 times 9.25 times 6.67 negative 11 times 5.98 24 divided by 2.6 to the 7th. See if you get that. Can you put it uh, block B face down on top? Uh, 7.1 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. That's how much kinetic energy our fuel has to supply. We haven't even looked at getting it up there. We haven't even looked at the potential energy. Sorry, did I say block B? Block H, right? You put it in the right block? Yeah, sorry. So there's the change in kinetic. That's that. And Megan, you're okay why we use that? Because they said orbital radius, which is the... I, I like that better, but sometimes they'll give you an altitude or a height like the last question. So I want to make sure you notice sometimes you've got to add the radius of the Earth. This one, though, we didn't have to. That's the change in kinetic. What else do I need to find, Melanie? Change in potential. What's change in anything? Okay, so I'm going to go now. Change in potential, which is potential final minus potential initial. And I wish I could go MGH, MGH, but we're talking the cosmic equation. So sadly, I've got to go negative big G M M over R final minus negative big G big M little m all over R initial. Brandon, do I have a minus minus? That would be a plus on the next line. Let's start plugging in numbers. Negative. Big G, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. Big M, mass of the Earth, 5.98 times 10 to the 24th. Little M, 925 all over 2.6 times 10 to the 7th. Minus? No, plus, Mr. Duick. You got a minus minus, which is a plus. 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. 5.98 times 10 to the 24th. 925. All over. What's our initial? Oh, radius of the Earth. Uh, 6.38 times 10 to the 6th. The change in potential energy is equal to did I go on a big rant about how it's important to practice with your calculator? You guys getting the hint? These are, these are pretty lengthy expressions. This is as long as it'll get. There'll be a couple that else later on in the year that are this long, but nothing much bigger than this. Negative 6.67, negative 11, times 5.98, times 10 to the 24th, times... 925 divided by divided by 2.6 times 10 to the 7th 
negative 1.419 times 10 to the 10th. Plus, second function, enter, or backspace if you got a scientific one. Lose the negative. 6.38 times 10 to the 6th. Five point seven eight three times ten to the tenth. Take away one point four one nine times ten to the tenth. Huh. 4.364 times 4.364 times 10 to the 10th joules. That's how much energy it's going to take to get it up there. Pardon me? Kinetic energy is less, but depends on the height that you're at. The lower you are, the faster you have to be going, so the less potential and the more kinetic. There is an equilibrium point somewhere. Don't know what it is. Figure it out if I was bored, I guess. We're not done. This question wanted us to find the work. Darn right. Taylor says we're going to add them. Absolutely. 7.1 times 10 to the ninth plus 4.1. 364 times 10 to the tenth. Thankfully, I got that number in my calculator still. Plus 7.1 times 10 to the ninth equals 5.07 times 10 to the tenth joules. So, what is that? 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 50 billion, 700 million joules of energy. And I got to be honest, a 925 kilogram satellite, that's a pretty small one. But doable and still profitable. Oh yes, we can go to Chuck Norris joke if we want to, but in terms of in terms of the technology. Very nice. Back to reality though. In terms of the technology, Despite the fact that that's a lot of fuel, companies are doing that and making a profit. It's certainly far cheaper to do that with our telecommunications than to lay the cables across the oceans like we used to. We used to lay dozens of cables along the bottom of the ocean and they had to be maintained and replaced. And you know, the bottom of the ocean is not exactly a hospitable place. And then they would get snagged on other cables or snagged on trawlers or whatever. Blech. Yo. Hustle back, please. So let's do some conceptual stuff, and then we'll talk about then we'll talk about how you calculate escape velocity. You may have heard the term. So, a missile is launched from the surface of the Earth. Its fuel is used in an initial burst, so they fire all their fuel for like 60 seconds, and then they turn off the engines so that as it rises, the only force it experiences is gravity. We're going to ignore air resistance. It was really realistic. Well, it would be on the moon. As it rises, what happens to the kinetic energy and the orbital potential energy? Let's see. As it rises, so we fire the engines, let's say, for 60 seconds, and then we shut them off. As it rises, what happens to its kinetic energy? Well, really what it's asking is, what happens to its speed? Erwin. Okay, it's going to, gravity is constantly pulling it down, slowing it down. It's going to slow down, 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 down. In fact, eventually it's going to reach its maximum height, its perihedron. Perihelion. I can't remember what the word fancy. There's a fancy trajectory word for it. It's going to reach its maximum height, but until then, it's slowing down. Until then, it's decreasing its kinetic energy. 
Now, what about its orbital potential energy? As it gets further and further away from the Earth, what happens to its orbital potential energy? Well, there, it's increasing. Because the higher it gets, the more energy it'll have when it falls back down to the Earth. C. And this is the idea that we're going to use for escape velocity. Here's what we're going to ask ourselves. Let's suppose instead of firing the jets for 60 seconds, we're not going to fire them for 30 seconds. We're not going to fire them for one second or a tenth of a second. Zach, let's suppose we fire the jets just for a split instant. Boom! So that we're at max speed instantly. How fast would we need to be going if we ignore air resistance to get away from the Earth and get to the edge of the universe? That's what we call escape velocity. Except because we said the edge of the universe has a potential energy of zero, what it's really asking is how much work is necessary to bring potential energy to zero. We can solve for an escape velocity by using conservation of energy. We can say this. Kinetic energy initial plus potential energy initial equals kinetic energy final plus potential energy final. Good old conservation of energy. Where initial is on the Earth's surface and final is at the very, very edge of the universe. If you're at the very, very edge of the universe, how much potential energy do you have? Okay, so I'm going to say equals zero because we're at the edge of the universe. And if we want to do this as efficiently as possible, so we're coasting, we're coasting, we're coasting, when we get to the edge of the universe, how fast would we like to be traveling if we've done the math just right? We would like to come to a stop at the edge of the universe. If we do the math just right, that's what we want. In fact, if we do the math just right, here's really what we're saying. The amount of kinetic energy that we need our engines is equal to negative the amount of potential energy on the Earth. The amount of kinetic energy that we need to impart to our engines, that we need to impart to our spacecraft initially, is going to be negative the amount of potential energy. What was kinetic energy? What was the equation? A half m. Uh, we're not on outer space. We're on the Earth's surface now, so we can take the shortcut. Yes, it is a half big G big. We got the shortcut here. Half mb squared. And potential energy was negative big G, big M, little m, all over R. Oh, are you saying there's another negative because it's already negative? Are you saying the two negatives would cancel? Yes, they would. We'd get a minus minus with a plus. And not only would the negatives cancel, what else would cancel? It turns out it doesn't matter how much mass you have, your escape velocity is the same. Now, the more mass, the more kinetic energy, the more fuel you have to burn to get to that escape velocity. But once you're there, it doesn't matter how big you are. Let's get the V by itself. How would I get the V by itself? First of all, I'd move the 1 half over. How? I think times by 2 is the nicer. nicer. Yes, it's divided by 0.5. Times by 2, and then how would I get rid of a squared? We have this. That's the escape velocity of any planet. The moons is fairly small. If you watch the old Apollo moon missions, you'll see on the very, very last one, they had a remote control camera. And because there's a six second delay between the camera signal getting to the Earth and sending the signal back to the moon. What the guy on the camera had to do when they were counting down to leave the moon is on six, he started to pan the camera up and he was hoping that by the time the signal would get there, he was panning up at just the right time for the Apollo moon module to launch from the moon. And the first two times they screwed it up on the very last one, if you Google, you'll find the, a YouTube image of them able to follow it up just wonderfully. And it's barely any escape velocity. It looks like they're just basically about the, like the propeller plane. doesn't seem like they're going fast at all. Well, 
Does the moon have a big mass or a small mass? Smaller compared to the Earth. And what's its radius compared to the Earth, bigger or smaller? Smaller. In fact, let's calculate the escape velocity for the Earth and for the moon. Escape velocity, we said, was equal to 2 big G big M over R. So the escape velocity for the Earth is going to be 2, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11, 5.98 times 10 to the 24th, all over 6.38 times 10 to the 6th, and then square root that puppy. If we ignore air resistance, how fast do you have to be traveling on the Earth's surface to lift off and reach the edge of the universe, to get away from the Earth's gravitational field, to break out of the Earth's pull? Square root. Uh, 1.12 times 10 to the fourth, is that right? I got 11,181. So 1.12 times 10 to the fourth meters per second. What about on the moon? Well, the mass and the radius are going to be different. I don't have those ones memorized. You'll have to give them to me from the sheet. What are they? Uh, 2, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. What's the mass of the moon? 10 to the what? Sorry? 22. And what's the radius of the moon, Dan? Now, I am going to be kind of lazy and go second function enter, second function enter, and let's see if I can just change these numbers to 7.35 times 10 to the 22 and 1.74 times 10 to the 6th. Yep. Square root of that. Considerably slower, smaller. 2.37 times 10 to the third. Yep. Uh, and as well, the moon doesn't have no atmosphere, so the whole ignoring air resistance there is mathematically valid. Here, clearly not. Well, this would be if you wanted to fire it all at once, okay? What they really do, of course, is they leave the engines burning for quite some time. And in fact, the most efficient way, they played around with two-stage, three-stage, four-stage. Most efficient way is the three-stage rocket, where you because most of the fuel is burned for the first chunk. And when you're done with that, you don't need those big engines anymore. They're dead weight. And in terms of potential energy, you know, if the masses don't cancel, so then you toss those, you burn another set of smaller engines, burn some more fuel, and it's the third stage, then you've gotten rid of, I think it's 90% of your mass, and you've achieved 90% of your velocity, so you're in a much better shape. The th three-stage rocket is the way to do it. That's why they did it for the moon landings. And the space shuttle is somewhat similar, has the booster rockets, and then the space shuttle's main engines burn the tank still, and then the tank itself falls off, and then the shuttle is using its onboard fuel and its main engines, so it's similar. Last one for me. Lego one? Yes. I had the Transformers one when I was a kid.
Hello, we're back. I know it's been a long lesson, but key concepts here. Last one. A 3,400 kilogram mass is... So here we're talking about, this is the physics or the maths, the math of an asteroid hitting us, except rather than an asteroid, I'm going to have oh, a satellite. Something's gone wrong. I'm keeping the math simple. I'm ignoring any kinetic energy that it has. So let's suppose somehow invisible angels brought a satellite to, the, to a stop and then let it go. It's going to fall to the Earth. How fast will it be going when it hits the ground? If we ignore air resistance and all that stuff. Uh, mass will matter because we're talking... Oh, sorry, for the speed, no. For the energy, yes. So we're falling, we're dropping something. This is going to be the same as when we drop an object here on Earth. It's going to be... Potential energy initial plus kinetic energy initial equals potential energy final plus kinetic energy final. Since it says released, we're going to assume that our initial speed was zero. Will its initial potential energy be zero? Nope. What about its final? Well, we're not using MGH anymore. We're using the cosmic one. It would only be zero if it fell to the center of the Earth. It's not going to be doing that. Will its final kinetic energy be zero? No, it's going to be hauling. In fact, we're going to get this. Negative big G, big M, little m, all over our initial equals negative big G, big M, little m, all over R Earth, because that's the final radius, plus a half M V final squared. Dan was right. The little masses cancel. That's kind of nice. And I think I would do this. First of all, I'll move this over by plussing it. And I don't like this one half. How can I get rid of this one half? Okay, I'm going to go times by two, times by two, times by two. They'll cancel right there. But that gives me a nicer expression. In fact, I think I get this. V final squared is equal to negative two big G big M all over R initial plus 2 big G big M all over our final, which is our Earth. Where'd the plus come from? This was a minus, and I plussed it over, so it became a plus. Where'd the twos come from? I didn't like the one half over there. Oh, and how do I get rid of a squared square root? So it would be 2 times mass of the Earth times... Now, the initial radius, it does say above, so the initial radius is going to be 6,300 plus 6.38 times 10 to the 6th meters. Might be. Yeah, you are, probably. I should have made this a much bigger number. I think so, yeah. I think you're right. 6,300 meters, that's not even a very high mountain. Yeah. <sighs> okay. It means above the Earth's surface. Really, I should have added a couple of zeros here, I think. I think what I was thinking initially was kilometers, but that's okay. Pardon me? 6,300? Right. They measure from sea level, yeah. Depending on how you want to call it, Mount Everest is not the highest mountain on Earth. It's not the closest mountain to the stars. Because the Earth bulges at the equator, there's a mountain in Ecuador because the Earth bulges out at the equator that is technically 
further away from the center of the Earth when you measure its very, very tip. It's closer to the stars, but they measure them from sea level. Folks, this quest lesson's gone on quite a bit, and the tone's going to go. I'm going to pause. I'm going to give you a couple of questions to try, though. One, two, three. By the way, in the homework, rather than writing relative to zero at infinity, he uses the abbreviation RTZEI, but that's relative to zero at infinity. In other words, he's saying use the cosmic potential energy. Um, uh, Seven. And I'm going to be assigning more from this lesson. I'm going to probably next class temporarily press pause. Okay. If you haven't handed in last lesson, please do. Tone's going to go in about 15 seconds or so, well, 45 seconds. <laughs>